snagging my coffee, sorry. Hi everyone, um, my name is Rachel Dugan and I am a field representative for Congressman Scott Peters and I also support the grants program here in San Diego. I also have our press secretary Daniela um, here on the back end to help monitor questions during the Q&A portion of the event and also helping with technology. So we're just gonna um, wait a few minutes um, as people log in and then I'm gonna hand it over to Congressman Peters to introduce our panelists. Want to wait a minute or are you ready to go? I think we'll give people a few seconds to log in. I think we can turn it over to you now. Okay. Hey everyone, um, this is uh, Congressman Scott Peters. Thanks for participating in my office's grant webinar. I am fresh off of the, uh, out of the car from the, from Dulles Airport, I just got out of San Diego. Finally, it's um, warmer in San Diego than it is here. So I don't know about the weather, but um, I was telling um, our guests today that I'm very, um, I'm very focused on making sure that grant money comes to San Diego. So we try to provide some help for you to know how to, to apply for that so that you're successful. Today, we have two experts who will cover the basics when it comes to applying for federal grants, specifically when it comes to funding for the arts. And then we'll talk a little bit about how my office can help. Our first guest is Dr. Michael Remsen. He's the CEO of the San Diego Youth Symphony. And he leads programming, fundraising, communications and collaborations with other organizations. Dr. Remsen has also served on the faculty of the Houston Ballet Academy, and he's an author who released his recent book, Music Education for Dancers, in September of 2022. We also have James Haddon. James is the Senior Director of Development and External Communications at the Museum of Us, which you may know by its former name, the San Diego Museum of Man. Mr. Haddon has a master's in arts from anthropology from Texas A&M University, did his graduate work was associated with the Institution of, Institute of Nautical Archaeology and included underwater archaeology field work at the 17th century port city of Port Royal, Jamaica. It seems like a fun place to do your work. I want to thank uh, Dr. Remsen and Mr. Haddon for taking the time to share your expertise today. Uh, at the end of their um, presentations, they will answer questions and their contact information will also provide that to you. So uh, really thanks again uh, to uh, Dr. Remsen, Mr. Haddon for joining us. Thanks for Rachel and Daniela for setting this up. And most important, thanks, thanks to all of you for um, looking at this federal money and seeing how we can bring it home to San Diego. That's, um, I know you'll do great work, great, um, great work with it. And I wish you the very best. All right, Rachel, I'll turn it back over to you and um, talk to you soon, bye-bye. All right, um, I'm gonna share my screen and then I'm gonna have our experts um, take it from here. Great. Well, lots of thanks, of course, to the Congressman for all the work that he already does on our behalf and uh, continues to do on our behalf. So it's great, so nice of him to introduce us and generous to share his time with us. He's got lots and lots of things to do. So, so James and I are super happy to be here today and let's just jump right in. So we, we have some individual things, James and I both have some individual things to share with you, but most of the time we're gonna, we're gonna popcorn this back and forth because so much of what we do is, is very similar and we can share uh, a lot of information. We're both veterans of applying to the National Endowment for the Arts uh, for funding. We've both received grants many times. And so uh, we'll give you a little bit of uh, introductions of ourselves and overview of the work that we've done overview of the process. Uh, that's really the big thing here is getting really understanding the process of doing this. They're pretty onerous uh, grants to apply for and you have to really 
follow the instructions. That's that's the most important tip we can give you of the day is just is to do what they tell you to do. Um, and uh, then we'll happily answer any questions that you guys might have out there. So uh, let's keep going. Great. So just starting it off, um, the one thing to know is that um, you know once you're applying at the federal level uh, for grants, that these grants are are very competitive. You're competing uh, with um, you know organizations from all over the country uh, who are um, you know leaders in their field uh, from all over the country. And something that it's at least a personal opinion of mine is that if if you are new to requesting public funding um, that you might want to make sure that you've got your local funding sources uh, really shored up. Uh, if you have a city or county or state funding uh, that you can apply for, um, the um, uh, that you should try applying for those first um, and educate yourself on how those work and the application and reporting requirements. And I say this for a variety of reasons. One is, is just, it, it helps you familiarize yourself. You know, again, city, county, state, and federal funding are, um, you know, just have a lot more application requirements that go with them. Um, and they're a little bit more bureaucratic just by the nature of the beast. And so it'll help you familiarize yourself with that process. Um, but also they are, uh, almost all peer reviewed. Uh, by, so they're going to get other experts from around the country to review those. And they all, almost all, will have feedback mechanisms built into them. So if you don't get grants from these things, you will almost always have an opportunity to receive feedback from your peers, or whether those are peers locally or from the state or from around the country, uh, to find out why you didn't get the funding and what you can do to improve your chances for getting grants next time. And it's just a really, you know, when you apply to a foundation or a corporation, you don't always get those, um, you know, you don't always get that feedback. And so this can be a really, really valuable way to hone your grant writing skills as you work your kind of work your way up the food chain, you, if you will, of working, getting towards federal grants, uh, because these, these NEA grants are the most competitive. They, you know, the NEA and the NEH may give hundreds of grants every year, but they're getting thousands of applications. And so in just one program like our town, they fund roughly one in five applicants. But the NEH, on the other hand, they may fund anywhere given the program, anywhere from 6% to 40% have a success rate. So that's just something to think about as you're, as you're getting ready to kind of start looking at these. So a popcorn to James. Sure, thanks, Michael. And as and kind of as, as you were already talking about, really, um, these panelists really look to see if you've received um, funding from from the local level. Um, they really want to see that you're already doing work that uh, is receiving community support locally. And that's really important to them because um, that really shows that you're engaging with your communities. And that's really a high point of, of every grant request that I see now proposal is really, you know, how you're impacting your community. And so if your program's already receiving um, support from local organizations, um, agencies, um, local um, foundations, that's really a good indicator that you've got support out there. And, and they don't necessarily want to be the first one to be you know, supporting a, a program. And also, I think a really important um, to thing to think about as well is, you know, don't be discouraged if you're not funded the first time out. As, as Michael said, you first of all, you can get feedback on, on how you may improve the second time. But I speak from um, experience on this. For example, we have, a, we have a big grant right now with Institute of Museum and Library Services to uh, reimagine our Race Are We So Different exhibit. And we were not funded by the IMLS on the first time around. And we actually um, looked again at which program it might fit better under the second time around. And we actually submitted a very similar ask in a different program. And we, we just realized, and, and we made that decision actually the first time around, we weren't sure which program we should, we should submit under. And so we picked one and it probably wasn't the best choice. And so 
you know, we the second year we we resubmitted it under a different program. We read all the the notes from the people that reviewed it the the first time around, made improvements, and then we we're funded this year. So I really encourage everyone. You know, it's it's not the end of the world if if you didn't get funded. I know it can feel like it, but um, you know you can often get funded on a second or a third try. Yeah, James, my my organization, the previous where I worked before my current position when I was still in Texas, it took us four times to on our applications before we finally got our first grant from the NEA. So and we did the same thing. We read the feedback and we thought about our application and we we didn't change programs. We knew we were in the right program, but we really looked at the feedback. And because it's slight, you know, and we'll talk, we'll dig a little further into it, but uh, and on further slides, but we we weren't quite crafting our application the right way uh, because the federal grants are slightly different than some of the local public grants you might apply for. And so we we weren't quite crafting it the right way. And it just it took us a couple times to get it right. But it's 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 definitely worth continuing to to pursue. So but it, not everybody gets it that first time. So for sure. Rachel, I think we can go to the next slide. So some tips to just start off with. We'll we'll uh, we'll uh, we'll come back to these two a little bit later. Uh, the first thing is to do your homework. So the so when you get to the the websites for the NEA and the NEH, they can really feel a little daunting. There is a lot of information on these sites, and uh, and a lot of it is pretty hefty reading. Uh, that has been crafted by people who don't always speak our language, uh, the language of grant writers and things like that. So really try and uh, take the time, you know, separate some time from yourself at the office to really read through these grants and read uh, as best you can to understand the different categories of funding that are out there. And then within each category, the different types of grants that are offered. So take the time and figure out where you fit uh, and where the type of project that you fit um, does best within the framework of these federal funders. So do that homework uh, and figure out exactly where you fit because there is really a, a fairly large variety of grants that are offered. Uh, there are many, many different disciplines that are offered. There are straight out arts grants, there are arts education grants, uh, so you have to really think about what is what is it that I'm asking to receive funding for, uh, and where does this best fit in the the way that the NEA looks at their funding model? Um, look at what it what it funds. All of that is very very carefully listed uh, on those website pages, and you can really look and say. Are they funding? Does this grant fund what I am hoping to get funded? And then look at who has received that funding as well. Uh, are other groups that are like you getting funding? Look at what, and very often they will list exactly what the projects are that they have received funding for. Uh, so you can look at like, what, what did this grant program fund last year? And you can look and it'll give you a two or three page, sorry, two or three sentence description of the grants that they gave funding for and read those descriptions. And is that, is that, does that sound like your program that you're looking for funding for? Because if it doesn't, then keep looking and find the programs that do sound like you. So, because you want to apply for those things that you are most closely aligned to, you don't want to try and, this is not the place to be like the outlier or the rebel uh, in grant writing. Like you want to be you want to kind of be the thing that you where you appear to be cl most closely related to the other folks that you are applying to. Yeah, and and I would add, be really aware of what stage you are in the project. There are all kinds of projects. So, for example, there are planning grants and there are implementation grants and there are professional development um, grants and you know lots of of, of monies that are. Um, that are really focused for different, you know, stages of a project. And so I would encourage you to really look at that carefully too, because, um, you know, and, and don't feel ashamed if you say, okay, well, I know I want this in product, but I, I don't know how to get there. And so we need money to help us plan and figure that out. So um, just, just kind of, you know, really be cognizant of those kinds of, of, 
of where you are in the process and give yourself a lot of time. And I think these last bullet points are all related to that, but um, especially if it's your first time out, but even, you know, I've done a lot of these and I always give myself, and this isn't project planning, this is literally just putting the, the, the grant package together, at least six weeks I like to have to, to do that. And, um, and, and don't also just think it's just the narrative. A lot of people make that mistake of, of looking at it and going, oh, well, it's a seven page narrative. It, you know, it won't take me that long to write a seven page narrative or maybe it does, but that's all they think about. And then at the last day or two, suddenly they're trying to gather all the attachments. And, that's at, and, and that you'll get yourself into a huge mess if you do that. And so really carefully go through that list of attachments of all the documents. First thing I do is I make a folder I, um, on my computer and I, and, I, and I actually print out the list and go through which ones I, which attachments I already have. Um, so I can just put those in the folder and knock them off the list and then start uh, really um, designing a plan of action and saying, okay, well, this one will take me, a, you know, an hour to put together. This one, I need to email someone and it'll take, you know, a week to get back from them, you know, those kinds of things. So really put as much energy or more into the, all the extra stuff that you do the narrative. <clears throat> and I think we can do the next slide. Yeah, those, you will, you, if you're like the fundraising person in your office, you will definitely need other people to get those attachments done. There's just no question. You're going to need your program folks to get those attachments done. Give them plenty of time because chances are they're not going to just have that thing if they're ready. They're going to need to tighten something up or make it pretty or, you know, kind of make it look better for the NEA. It's, you know, they're not gonna have like those lesson plans or whatever it is just ready to go for you. So they're gonna need that time. So, yeah. Um, so the I think one of the things too is that, you know, if, if you're somebody who's a veteran of some city or county or state level grants, um, a lot of those, the, one of the hardest things, at least for me, when I first started applying to the NEA, one of the hardest kind of shifts in thinking for me was that a lot of those city, county, and state level grants tend to give you grants just for being a good guy, right? Like they're just giving you a grant for being a wonderful organization that's doing great work. A lot of it tends to be towards general operating support. Federal grants, those NEA grants especially, are very specific to a project. They want to fund a project with a very clear start and end date with very clear goals, very clear outcomes, very clear evaluation criteria. It's It's got to be a project. And I think definitely the first time I applied to the NEA, I was like, you should just fund us because we're a fabulous organization that does amazing work and that we're, 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 we're the leader in our area and all of those good things. And they came back and were like, you haven't told us what project it is you want us to fund. Like they wanted real clarity around what it was. And I think that's that sometimes when you're used to writing public grants that go the other way, um, it's it's a difficult thing to kind of wrap your head around. And, and for some organizations, like your whole organization is a project. And especially when, um, when I first started writing NEA grants, the organization I was with, we just did one project a year. And it was hard to kind of separate out like one like we're, we're an organization that just does one project, but we still have to write it that we were the project and not the organization. And, and if you, you have to make sure that you're doing it that way so that you don't confuse the NEA. So, yeah. Yeah. And to add on this and this, and this kind of also dovetails with what I was talking about um, earlier about understanding the phase of the project um, and many phases, for example, the, we have two, uh, along with the race exhibit IMLS project, we have another one with the Kumeyaay community right now kind of running in parallel. And they are both projects that are exhibit related, but th the, the phase we're in is actually content development and, and preliminary exhibit design. There is, won't be an exhibit fabricated at the end of that. And so we really had to um, you know, build a case of need and support around that that will take, we're working with communities closely on that. It will take a long time to do that. We need resources to do that properly. 
and really put guardrails around that. And then also very, very clearly defined objectives of what we'll have at the end of that. And so um, panelists really will smell um, something wrong if you haven't done that. If you kind of are, are wishy-washy about that and um, aren't clear about that, they really will understand, they'll say this person, this organization doesn't understand the project or, or they're trying to pull something on us or whatever. And you don't want those yellow flags going up. So, so um, I think that's, that's really important to, to understand. And, and don't be necessarily scared of that. You know, I think a lot of people, even when we did the, the, these two IMLS projects are like, well, well, you won't have an exhibit at the end. They understand that and they understand we're working with communities and it's going to take a while to do this and it takes a lot of resources, but don't try to promise them an exhibit at the end of that, but be clear that this is the phase of the project you're in. Rachel, I think we can go to the next slide. These okay, are so these are these are mine. And so um, uh, these are a lot of, um, if you work in the museum world, some of these will be really familiar to you. That is, if, if especially if you've had federal grants before, but uh, federal grants in, in our uh, part of the world uh, often require cost sharing. So be really um, aware of that. And it, and it means that you're creating a real significant resource um, commitment by the institution. So for example, the two IMLS projects we have ongoing right now have a cost sharing from us of half a million dollars. And, and that's often done in salaries or um, staff time. And so it means that we've really committed at least a half a million dollars worth of work of our institution, which is a big chunk of our time um, to these projects. Um, and I, I mentioned earlier these different programs. And for example, we, we switched which program we submitted um, for, for our race exhibit. Really check out the agencies that you're looking at. Uh, the IMLS is a really great um, in, um, agency for museum funding, but it has programs called like the Inspire program, which is for smaller museums and um, the Museums Empowered Programs, um, which is a lot about professional development and training. I think there's some really good um, program um, areas in there for DEAI um, development at institutions. So, so check that out for that. The Museums for America is where we've been very successful with funding for it supports museums of all sizes and disciplines, but really with strategic based um, projects. So we've really been um, utilizing those funds for community-driven exhibits and programs at the museum. And um, their grants can range from $5,000 to $250,000 and go over um, you know, multiple years. It used to be two years. They've kind of been expanding that to three-year projects now. And um, they have a great website with um, a really comprehensive list of successfully funded projects. And, and I really, as, as Michael mentioned earlier, you need to go on there. You need to check it out if that's an um, an agency that you think uh, might fit the bill for your needs. But um, you really need to check out and see what they're funding. Rachel, next next slide. Um, again, I'm I'm a little bit of a broken record on this, but uh, what I keep finding over and over, especially the last few years, is uh, these. Um, projects that show connection to community. Those are, it's really um, a, a point of priority for funding agencies that I see around museum grants right now and really content generated by community. So there, you see less and less of the support for some expert curator doing something in the museum world. You wanna see um, content that's being developed and driven by community and um, there's program funding for all kinds of, uh, not only the phases of a project, but collections care, um, project development, um, and public programming. So I think, um, you know, really there's a, there's a whole gamut of grants that you can look for. Um, and also applications often include a, a cross-disciplinary approach. I see that a lot. So don't get too siloed in your ask. And then another on this whole 
um, aspect of the timeliness of and kind of you know pacing yourself in development of the um, the proposal. I always start asking for support letters a month before they're due. I also write a draft for them and send it to them and say, um, you know, here's a draft. If, if you'd like to write your own, that's fine, but at least you're not starting with a blank sheet of paper. And I always find that their people are very appreciative of that and are much more willing to, to do a letter of support for you if you help them write it. So, um, and I think that's probably, that's, that's it, Rachel, we can go to the next slide. And over to me. That's those support letter comment. I cannot agree with that enough. Start at least a month in advance, at least, and and get also offer offer to draft it for them. Every time when I offer to draft it for them, they're like, "That would be awesome. Thank you so much." You know, and then you'll and eventually over time you'll have like a a set of support letters, like of drafts ready to go, and you can just you know you'll have them on file that you can send out to people. Um, so my area is in arts project grants and arts education related grants, I should mention, so the, the grants we currently receive are to fund uh, programs that we do uh, in schools uh, to help uh, schools that don't have any uh, arts related programming or where there are or where arts related programming needs bolstering or additional support. So we run music education programs down in South Bay uh, and in East County right now, and those are supported by the NEA. Uh, to help schools build long-term sustainability with their arts programming. Um, so arts project grants is the NEA's largest funding area. Uh, and they are, as I said, they're very competitive. As I said, it took us four times before we finally got our first grant, but they do give hundreds of them each year and funding was just increased uh, in the new federal spending bill. So that should give more of them available. Mm -hmm. um, grants generally range in the 10,000 to 100,000 a range, uh, $100,000 would be a lot uh, for one of these. I think the largest one I've ever received has been in the 50,000 range, uh, anywhere from 30,000 to 50,000 uh, for these kinds of arts projects. They don't always expect a match per se uh, on those grants, but they do expect that you're gonna have more than, you know, that the cost of the project is gonna be more than 50,000. I would discourage you from applying, especially at the NEA level, uh, for a grant where they are the sole funder. Uh, that's not something that the NEA generally likes to do. Uh, they want to see that there is other money coming in from other sources. In general, I would say that's probably not a good policy for most public grants. I think there's some that are willing to do that, but I think most like to see that there are other sources of funding that are a part of it because they want to see that there will be some sustain sustainability in the community. Uh, Arts Project Grants fund any number of disciplines. They fund artist communities around the country, arts education, dance, design, folk and traditional arts, literary arts, local arts agencies like uh, state, city, and county agencies, media arts, uh, museums, music, musical theater, opera, presenting and multidisciplinary works, theater, and visual arts. So there are a lot of uh, opportunities in a lot of arts areas. And the NEA is committed to a broad range of styles and activities within each of those areas. So once again, do your homework. And, and a tip you know, that will echo several times is to use the NEA as a resource if you're not sure exactly where you fall. Um, the grants officers at the NEA are there to help you. And they are there to be a resource. And they are all lovely and nice people uh, who are uh, invested, their job is to help the government give the money away to organizations just like us. And so they are there to be a resource. So you should feel free, you know, almost every program will list who the program officer is on their webpage, and you should email them and call them because they are there to help you. So we can bounce to the next slide. Thank you. Um, as stated, you know, the NEA likes to fund projects. And so if you take music as just one example, projects can include performances or presentations. They'll also fund commissions. Uh, they also like professional artistic development. So things like training programs or residencies and workshops, that would be an example of like a project. So you could say, like a group like mine could say, hey, we wanna 
offer uh, training programs for teachers in a particular district to give them the skills to do X that they don't have already. And we would, and then you would fill out the project by saying, how over what period are you going to offer this training program? How many teachers are you going to are you going to see? How many hours of training are they going to receive? Who's going to offer this training and what is their certification? Um, and then what is it that the teachers will be able to do that they didn't do before? How many students will that impact, et cetera, et cetera? So they, they, you know, the NEA loves to see numbers, data, and impact. That's what they want to know from all of these types of things. And in the museum world, like for James, they want to know when you get to the point of doing an exhibit, they want to know like how many people are going to be impacted by this, how many school children will come see it, how many people will come through, what are, what's the outreach potential of these things. Um, the NEA would also fund things like engagement or education. They fund reporting and technology uh, projects. They'll fund audience engagement programs. So, you know, like a lot of classical music groups are doing a lot of DEI initiatives on how to bring BIPOC audiences in. And so there may be doing special projects around that. There are things like special recording projects, like, like there's a lot of projects right now in classical music to record uh, neglected works by BIPOC composers. So there's a lot of work in that arena happening. Youth projects that would be serving in my area or serving the disabled. All of those could be, you know, you can really drill down into these kind of niche projects that you could be looking at. And the NEA is very, very interested in these types of things, especially those types of projects that allow the arts to reach communities uh, that typically may not be reached in some way or another, whether that is through a disability, whether that is through uh, a community that is not, you know, that is typically underserved, whether it's by race or by location, it could be that they're a rural community, or whether it's by age or just by socioeconomic, I mean, any of those factors are ways that uh, the NEA would look and say, this is exciting that you're being able to reach out and really connect to a community in an authentic and a meaningful way. So they're, they love things like this. Uh, things that other projects that the NEA likes are things that serve the field in some way or another. So workshops and conferences are very frequently served, uh, are funded by the NEA. So in my field, for example, something like the League of American Orchestras, I'm sure receives funding from the uh, National Endowment for the Arts for their uh, for conferences that they hold that serve the field of uh, orchestral music. So, so as I've said, the NEA website can be dense, and it, 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 it's not that it can be dense, it is dense, but keep looking, and the project, because the project categories are there, and you'll find the one that best suits you. And once again, if you can't find what you're looking for, then find something close and, you know, call the NEA or email them and say, here's the type of project that I'm thinking about, and they are always friendly and helpful, and they know that the process can be daunting. They know that there's a lot of information there, and they will help steer your, steer your project towards the, the one that is the most likely for funding. Let's go on to the next uh, slide. And so some general tips. So once again, um, do your homework with the federal grant portals. There are some registrations that you need to do um, that are beyond just the NEA grant portals. There are some federal registration things uh, that you have to do, grants.gov. I forget what SAM stands for, James. What is that? That's the um, system for something administration. Administration I, yeah. management or something. It's a federal thing. As soon as you get into the grants.gov thing, they will ask you to do your SAM registration. These are all things that you'll have to get um, you know, your, your 501c3 registration and your EIN number and various things. And those have to be renewed every year for you to keep your grants.gov uh, registration current. So make sure all of those things are up and running and that they're current uh, and so that you don't get tripped up on that when you're getting ready to do your submissions. Yeah, you know, the, the SAM registration, that really means you're an entity that's been approved to to go into contract with the government. So with that government. all has to be done. If you receive city fundings, you, you also have to have your SAM registration yeah. current. So that's something um, just, and it's not on this, but um, almost, or it seems like all the federal, all the different granting agencies now are going through a, something called um, login.gov. So you, there's one 
one way to get in each one or one set of passwords. So, um, and and that can all be very confusing. So, um, so spend some some time on that um, because it's it can get complicated and scary sometimes. But people will help you if you have problems. Um, as I was saying, each in agency tends to have its own portal. So, you know, I am we we have grants with IMLS. We have ones with the National Park Service. Um, each one has its own portal, and um, and you you now do reports through that. You do um, requests for um, um, reimbursement or advances on your budget um, through that. We some of them, the IMLS one even does the I, the emails come through there or messaging comes through there. So you really have to get comfortable working in those um, portals. Go to the, all the webinars that they have for um, the projects. They're really good about walking you through it step by step and taking some of the kind of anxiety uh, around <clears throat> preparing it and giving you the really important um, things of like when reports will be due because there will be reports due. And so realize that that's gonna be part of the of, of receiving federal money is you need to report on it. And um, you know make sure that you're clear about um, how to apply and all the forms and all of those things before you you start because you can it can be really scary towards the you know the last few days and the deadlines um, coming up and suddenly you you reread something and realize you haven't done a form or you know we had this one time with a, a there's a, a a digital form a digital product form with IMLS and um, it can it's it requires a lot of knowledge about digital products. And for a while you didn't have to submit it at all. And then for one year you had to submit it even if you didn't and it got very confusing. So you've got to, you've got to go through, I get on the portal when, when the um, program is announced and go through, download the package, make sure I understand what's all um, required in that package. I think next slide. Um, know who your grant officer is. Uh, once you once you find the project that you're, you know, the program area that you're working with, you will know who your grants officer is, memorize their name, <laughs> and uh, get their email address and know that they are there to help you. Uh, I know my grants officer. I actually uh, had an opportunity at one point to go to Washington uh, on something unrelated, and I made an appointment. I called and I said, hey, can I come by and see you? And I met my grants officer. This was before we ever got our first grant, and I'm still friends with my grant officer. And actually, that's how I became a, a panelist. I ended up serving as a panelist for the NEA uh, because I knew her. And so it's, um, it is definitely good to know them. And they are there to help you, and they they want you to be successful in this process. Remember that they cannot give you direct advice, like you cannot show them your grant application, and they'll they can't tweak it for you or tell you what to do or what not to do. But they will always try and guide you in the right direction. And probably the most important piece of feedback I, or tip I can give you, and from my own experience on this, is if you are denied a grant, which happens all the time get the feedback that they have. You will, if you are denied a grant, your grant officer will call you and offer to set up an appointment with you, to, or they'll send you an email and offer to set up an appointment with you to review the feedback that came from the grants panel. Do it. I, I can't emphasize it enough. I, um, I, did, uh, I did it every year that we were turned down, those first three years that we got turned down. And then the fourth time when we got the grant panel, I still got off, offered the chance to do it. And I got on the phone and my grants officer said, you know what, I just want you to know, I'm so excited that you got the grant this time. And I've been rooting for you to get the grants. And because I want you to know that you're one of the very few who kept at it and kept calling me and getting the feedback every time. And I know, and I, I've seen your grants every time and I can see you've been listening and making adjustments. And I'm so glad that you finally got the grant because you've you followed the process the way it was supposed to get. So that process is there. It's there for you and it's there to help you and it's designed to support you so that you can be successful in it. And I am a I'm a success story of federal grants and I've gotten many, many grants now, but I'm a success story at it because I followed the process. So I can't can't tell you enough of that. So.
um, a couple of these other general tips we've 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 hit. hit on them before about not waiting to the last minute. So I don't want to belabor that more. I think we've made the the point pretty strongly about that. But on that, I really wanted to warn everyone about the federal grant portals, um, especially on the the due date. Especially, you know, there are some agencies that will have all their grants done. Um, you know, on one day or something. And I advise don't wait till the last day to submit it. Um, I have had when I've, during the pandemic, for example, I was doing that on a final day and the portal kept freezing. And it's, it just is awful that feeling when you feel like it's going to crash and lose all your stuff. And so submit it at least the day before and you'll, your life will be much easier. So yeah. with that, it always gets can... hosed up. Always. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. We can move. How are we on. doing, Rachel? I, I I sense we're running out of time. Yeah. Yeah, we have about five more minutes on the slides just to give us enough time um, for Q and A. Okay, great. Let's let's buzz through. I don't think we have too many more slides, do we? Yep. Go to the next one. Yep. So I think I think we're still kind of we're still kind of honing in on a lot of these things, same things. Grant staff is there to help you. Forms are confusing. Yep. Yep. So here's a couple that we should do. So don't assume that even if you're a famous organization locally in your area, don't assume that the panelists are from your area or that they know you. Don't use acronyms in your in your application because you know you could be an organization in Boston. And I'm your panelist in San Diego, and I'm not going to know what your acronyms are. Don't. And if you start talking about underserved neighborhoods or communities that you're serving in your area, don't don't assume that I know who they are or what they are. Take an extra sentence in your narrative to just say, you know, here is this underserved community. It is, you know, these are the demographics that we are trying to reach, so that you are painting that picture for us, uh, because. Uh, if you, and I've even seen this serving on California, uh, I've served on California Arts Council panels, I'm serving on them now actually, and you know, I'm a fairly new Californian and I, you know, I'm reading grants from, you know, Northern California or Sacramento or something, and I don't know all the neighborhoods and underserved neighborhoods in Sacramento. So it's, so you have to kind of make sure that you're painting that vivid, compelling picture that anybody would understand. Yeah, and and on top of that, oh, can you go back, Rachel? Um, write a really compelling organizational um, overview. Depending on the agency, you may that may be a separate document, a one pager, or that kind of thing. But kind of tagging on what Michael said earlier, they're not funding the organization; they're funding a project, not the whole organization. So you need to make sure that you've you've given a good view of what the organization does and that's compelling, but that's in one part of the, the, the application. The application. Uh, it needs to live there. And then the rest of the, the rest of the applications about the project. And so uh, make sure that that organizational overview is compelling and easy to read and gives a really good snapshot of the organization. Cause yeah. then you're going to move on to the project and you need to let go of trying to explain what the organization does more broadly. Absolutely. So stop, that's, stop doing it at that point. Yep. Yeah, that's really that's really important. And so yep. um, and and then really tell why uh, why this project is important and who does it matter to and why are you the best fit for doing that? So those are some really standard kind of grant writing um, um, tips, but there are important. Um, you can mix quantitative and qualitative information. People love um, personal stories, but you also need to give them some numbers and and and, mm -hmm. um, you know, quantitative information to to kind of talk about impact. So it's important to have a mix of those things. And then really, you know, collaborations, this is not anything new if you're in the grant world, but collaborations are really key and important. And um, especially if you're bringing um, different communities together, really um, talk about those and um, and the importance of them. Rachel, yep. we, can, we can move on. Great, and then just a few notes about budgets. Be very careful in your budgets and make sure that it makes sense. All future budgets should zero out. You cannot budget for a deficit uh, in the future, so you budget to balance. 
Um, be very careful with math mistakes. It's the first thing that panelists will ding you on is it will look unprofessional if you have math mistakes. And just make sure that your grant that you're spending money on quote unquote, it's, I, I hate saying it this way, but like kind of the right things. Like so spend money on, you know, on teaching artists or on, you know, just on the on staff and things that look good for you to be spending money on. And just make sure that you're not spending money on things that are would be more questionable. So for example, I had a I, I did a grant once that was a wonderful, wonderful program that served underserved youth and it was everything was right about this grant and they took all these kids on this wonderful boat trip but the entire grant was to pay for the boat and instead of paying the teaching artists or paying for the campsite or paying for the food for the kids or paying for art supplies or any of these other things it was to pay this one guy to to rent to pay for the boat and you just sat there and went well gosh like that that doesn't seem right that they've you know that they could do this you know wonderful program in another way instead of spending all this money on the boat and it just felt wrong to kind of do that so you just want to be careful and even in the grants i'm reviewing right now um the math like i had a i have a grant that i reviewed that they asked for the full amount of the grant they presented a budget that was the full amount uh th that everything was the full amount but then they said that the program was tuition based and they didn't account for the tuition income in the budget. So it didn't take me more than 10 seconds to figure out that the math didn't add up. If they get the full grant and the tuition income, then they've got more money than the amount that they're saying that the grant costs. So the numbers aren't adding up. So make sure everything's logical and it all comes and it all makes sense in your budget. Yeah. And just, you know, and if something is important in your narrative and then it's not reflected in the budget, people you confuse people. So, um, you know, if it's a big aspect of the project and it's not, doesn't seem to cost anything, whether by staff time or whatever, that that's a big red, red flag to me. Um, most of these, like read your grant out loud, proofread. Um, people, you know, even if they don't keep a tally of your typos, it, 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 they ring up as reviewers look. Um, there's all kinds of ways to proofread people. Um, it's great to have another person read it. Um, I've uh, sometimes when my brain's turned off, I read things backwards. I mean, there's all kinds of tricks to to proofread, but um, utilize whatever works best for you. And do it. And do it. Okay. Oh, and then, uh, sorry, we'll go through quickly. So audio and video, if the guidelines say three minutes, don't send eight minutes, send three minutes. And please don't make panelists queue it up. Like do the edit, you know, you any teenager can edit video for you. And so, you know, don't send a 10 minute video and say, please queue this up to seven minutes and 15 seconds. It's like panelists won't, panelists are reviewing, does like the current grants I'm on, I'm reviewing 50 grants. I do not have time to queue up video to the place. So just send it. Just you know, send what you want us to watch, and that's the best thing. And please make sure I even on these grants I'm doing right now, make sure that your videos aren't password protected and that they're accessible. I had several Vimeo links that I got sent on grant applications, and I clicked the link, and it says it's password protected. I I can't go back, and I'm not allowed to contact you and say, "Hey, can I get the password for that?" Like that's that we're not allowed to do that. So I don't get to see your stuff and video is super important. So, um, you know, you want me to see it. You want your panelists to see it. Yeah, and make sure audio is clean and clear. Volunteer for grant panels. I mean, it's that's a really great way to Learned know so how much. The, the inner workings work. And so I think that's, that's it. Yeah. You learn a ton. That's good. We'll stop there. Thank you so much. So we do have two questions for you gentlemen. Um, let me queue them up. Okay, so the first question is, um, how do you know who your grants officer is? Is it the same person for all federal grants or from a particular department? So on, on the NEA website, at least the, James, you might have a different experience of this, but on, for at least on arts projects, when you find the particular project area or program area, I should say, so like if you're in music and then arts education and then opera or something like that, at the typically at the bottom of that web page that's describing that program area, 
it says program officer and it has their name and their email address. It's, so it's almost always on every web page there on the NEA website. Yeah, they're 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 different different agencies. Um, people will have different portfolios of in different programs. Sometimes it'll be cross um, programs. But the the federal government is good about listing um, who who it is, and it'll it'll often be, or at least in the case that were ours, on um, they'll do like a pro a formal program announcement of the grant, and it'll have all the information about it and on that document. And often they're like forty pages long, so you know reserve it half a day or something, and and the um, the person will be on that. Yeah, list, and I so. think on the NEA contact, there's probably a contacts page also that lists all of the departments and who the contacts are for each department too. So they're they're pretty good at listing all that out. And then our last question, um, unless another one arrives, is going to be: Can an organization that serve in developing countries apply and have access to these funds? That's a great question. I, <laughs> I think the work has to be here. I think my understanding, and so don't quote me on this, but I think that it is for work that takes place within the 50 states and the U.S. territories. So Yeah, I would say generally that's probably the case. And, and again, I'm not an, a huge expert on this. I think yeah. there are certainly agencies within the federal government that do supportive work of um, countries and uh, of developing countries. Um, but um, the vast, like the agencies like NEH, IMLS, th those those kinds of um, ones um, who would be the most obvious ones to go for are, are, um, um, are all kind of domestically um, uh, rooted, but yeah. But that being that being said, like if you have if your project is really interesting and involves some kind of cultural exchange between like a U.S. arts group and a and a or a U.S. Re, you know like cultural group and a and a cultural group in a developing country, I would ask a program officer um, at the NEA about it and see if they couldn't refer you to somebody who might like it, it would probably be outside the NEA it might be in a different federal agency because there are all sorts of interesting grant programs that live in other federal agencies like we've stayed pretty focused on the two biggies which are the National Endowment for the Arts and the National Endowment for the Humanities but you know there are all sorts of interesting funding opportunities block grants you know there's housing and urban development has interesting you know grants and things so they might know something about another type of cultural exchange grant that might be available through a different agency that they could send you to. So I wouldn't yeah. I wouldn't give up hope, but it just might not come through one of the more conventional sources. Yeah, and and I do think like I can't imagine that the UN doesn't have um, arts programming grants, um, and so um, so that would be to me that would be one of the other first place I would ch check with you know, right. these federal agencies as, as well to see if they could steer you. But I would go to the UN website too to see um, because or, it- Or even um, the embassy of the, of the country itself, you know, because yeah. there's all sorts and there are lots of weird short-term things because like I'm a composer by training. And so I received a grant from Americans for the Arts back when it was still called Arts USA. And I went over and was a composer in residence with the um, Ulster Orchestra, and I lived in Belfast for three months. So that was, and I was doing programs that was all over there. But as an American, I was being sent over as like a goodwill ambassador over there. So there's all sorts of weird projects like that. So it's just kind of, you just have to kind of dig and know where, you know, kind of know where they are sometimes. So yeah, it's weird. And the follow up question was any idea where we're we can find these types of grants to serve in developing countries, but it sounds like you guys kind of covered that, um, you know, talk to the embassies, be a little, uh, think outside the box, um, yeah. you know, I to would, find that funding. You know, and just like, you know, I mean, Google is the most amazing tool in the universe. And I would just, I would just start on Google and be like, you know, grants for work, for cultural work in whatever the developing country is. 
and just kind of see see what kind of pops up and you know spend a couple hours you know going down the rabbit holes on Google because there's so much out there and it, I mean it's shocking how much support there is for this type of you know cultural and humanities work that's out there. Yeah, I see like the International Fund for the Promotion of Culture through the United Nations. There you go. There's a United yeah. Nations Educational, Scientific, and Cultural Organization. So I think, you know, they're, I know there's funding. I I, there I know there's funding out there for it. Yeah. yeah. Local and lo your local embassy is going to be the best place to start on something like that. Real fast, I'm just going to share my screen briefly just to pull up our email addresses. Sure. And then if no one has any additional questions, um, I think that's a wrap, um, unless anything else comes in. But thank you, gentlemen, so much, uh, James. Thank you so much, Michael. You guys did a wonderful job. Thanks and for having us. Yeah, it was a pleasure. Yeah. Um, Please thank the congressman again. Absolutely. And yeah. can everyone see our, our email address if anyone needs anything from myself, Those are not our James? Email addresses. Rachel, you just have our names up there. Oops. I think your last slide yeah, may have last. it. You have the title slide up there. Stop sharing. We're not hard to find, and that's the good yeah. news. <laughs> How's that? Did that's I do it? That's Yay. Yay. <laughs> um, okay, gentlemen, thank you again. Um, if anyone needs anything, please reach out to, you know, any of us. We're happy to help. Um, and good luck with all of your applications. Um, I know, yeah, yeah. as James we'll get and that money. Have, yeah, it's super competitive, um, but good luck. And let us know if we can be of any support. Great. Thank you all. Thanks, James. Thank it was fun. Okay. Take care, bye James. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, Michael. Bye. Thanks a lot. Bye.